The Crucible, Act 3. The vestry room of the Salem Meeting House now serving as the anteroom of the general court. As the curtain rises, the room is empty, but for sunlight pouring through two high windows in the back wall. The room is solemn, even forbidding. Heavy beams jut out, boards of random widths make up the walls. At the right are two doors leading into the meeting house proper, where the court is being held. At the left, another door leads outside. There is a plain bench at the left and another at the right. In the center, a rather long meeting table with stools and a considerable armchair snugged up to it. Through the partitioning wall at the right, we hear a prosecutor's voice, Judge Hawthorne's, asking a question. Then a woman's voice, Martha Corey's replying. Now, Martha Corey, there is abundant evidence in our hands to show that you have given yourself to the reading of fortunes. Do you deny it? I am innocent to a witch. I know not what a witch is. How do you know, then, that you are not a witch? If I were, I would know it. Why do you hurt these children? I do not hurt them. I scorn it. I have evidence for the court. Voices of townspeople rise in excitement. You will keep your seat. Thomas Putnam is reaching out for land. Remove that man, Marshal. You're hearing lies, lies. A roaring goes up from the people. Arrest him, Excellency. I have evidence. Why will you not hear my evidence? The door opens and Giles is half carried into the vestry room by Herrick. Hands off, damn you. Let me go. Giles, Giles. Out of my way, Herrick. I bring evidence. You cannot go in there, Giles. It's a court. Enter Hale from the court. Pray, be calm a moment. You, Mr. Hare, go in there and demand I speak. A moment, sir. A moment. They'll be hanging my wife. Judge Hawthorne enters. He is in his sixties, a bitter, remorseless Salem judge. How do you dare come roaring into this court? Are you gone daft, Corey? You're not a Boston judge yet, Hawthorne. You'll not call me daft. Enter Deputy Governor Danforth, and behind him, Ezekiel Cheever and Paris. On his appearance, silence falls. Danforth is a grave man in his sixties of some humor and sophistication that does not, however, interfere with an exact loyalty to his position and his cause. He comes down to Giles, who awaits his wrath. Danforth looking directly at Giles. Who is this man? Giles Corey, sir, and a more contentious. I am asked the question and I am old enough to answer it. To Danforth, who impresses him and to whom he smiles through his strain. My name is Corey, sir, Giles Corey. I have 600 acres and timber in addition. It is my wife you be condemning now. And how do you imagine to help her cause with such contemptuous riot? Now be gone. Your old age alone keeps you out of this jail. They be telling lies about my wife, sir. I, do you take it upon yourself to determine what this court shall believe and what it shall set aside? Your Excellency, we mean no disrespect for... Disrespect, indeed. It is disruption, mister. This is the highest court of the supreme government of this province. Do you know it? Your Excellency, I only said she were reading books, sir, and they come and take her out of my house for... Books? What books? Giles, through helpless sobs. It is my third wife, sir. I never had no wife that be so taken with books, and I thought to find the cause of it, you see? But it were no witch I blamed her for. I have broke charity with the woman. I have broke charity with her. Excellency, he claims hard evidence for his wife's defense. I think that in all justice you must. Then let him submit his evidence in proper affidavit. You are certainly aware of our procedure here, Mr. Hale. Clear this room. Come now, Giles. We are desperate, sir. We come here three days now and cannot be heard. Who is this man? Francis Nurse, Your Excellency. His wife's Rebecca, that were condemned this morning. Indeed. I am amazed to find you in such uproar. I have only good report of your character, Mr. Nurse. I think they must both be arrested in contempt, sir. Let you write your plea, and in due time I will. Excellency, we have proof for your eyes. God forbid you shut them to it. The girl, sir, 
The girls are frauds. What's that? We have proof of it, sir. They are all deceiving you. Danforth is shocked, but studying Francis. This is contempt, sir. Contempt. Peace, peace, Judge Hawthorne. Do you know who I am, Mr. Nurse? I surely do, sir, and I think you must be a wise judge to be what you are. And do you know that near to four hundred are in the jails from Marblehead to Lynn, and upon my signature? I, and seventy-two condemned to hang by that signature? Excellency, I never thought to say it to such a weighty judge, but you are deceived. Enter Giles Corey from left. All turn to see as he beckons in Mary Warren with Proctor. Mary is keeping her eyes to the ground. Proctor has her elbow as though she were near collapse. Mary Warren. What are you about here? Proctor, pressing Paris away from her with a gentle but burnt motion of protectiveness. She would speak with the deputy governor. Danforth, shocked by this, turns to Herrick. Did you not tell me Mary Warren were sick in bed? She were, Your Honor. When I go to fetch her to the court last week, she said she were sick. She has been striving with her soul all week, Your Honor. She comes now to tell the truth of this to you. Who is this? John Proctor, sir. Elizabeth Proctor is my wife. Beware this man, Your Excellency. This man is mischief. I think you must hear the girl, sir. She... Danforth, who has become very interested in Mary Warren and only raises a hand toward Hale. Peace. What would you tell us, Mary Warren? Proctor looks at her, but she cannot speak. Proctor. She never saw no spirits, sir. Danforth, with great alarm and surprise to Mary. Never saw no spirits? Giles, eagerly. Never. Proctor, reaching into his jacket. She has signed his deposition, sir. Danforth, instantly. No, no, I accept no depositions. He is rapidly calculating this. He turns from her to Proctor. Tell me, Mr. Proctor, have you given out this story in the village? We have not. They've come to overthrow the court, sir. This man is... I pray you, Mr. Paris, do you know, Mr. Proctor, that the entire contention of the state in these trials is that the voice of heaven is speaking through the children? I know that, sir. Danforth thinks staring at Proctor, then turns to Mary Warren. And you, Mary Warren, how came you to cry out people for sending their spirits against you? It were pretense, sir. I cannot hear you. It were pretense, she says. Ah, and the other girls, Susanna Walcott, and the others, they are also pretending? Aye, sir. Danforth, wide-eyed. Indeed. Excellency, you surely cannot think to let so vile a lie be spread in open court. Indeed not, but it strike hard upon me that she will dare come here with such a tale. Now, Mr. Proctor, before I decide whether I shall hear you or not, it is my duty to tell you this. We burn a hot fire here. It melts down all concealment. Proctor, I know that, sir. Let me continue. I understand well. A husband's tenderness may drive him to extravagance in defense of a wife. Are you certain in your conscience, mister, that your evidence is the truth? It is, and you will surely know it. And you thought to declare this revelation in the open court before the public? I thought I would, I, with your permission. Now, sir, what is your purpose in so doing? Why, I, I would free my wife, sir. There lurks nowhere in your heart, nor hidden in your spirit, any desire to undermine this court? Why, no, sir. <clears throat> I, your excellency, Mr. Cheever, I think it be my duty, sir. You'll not deny it, John. When we come to take his wife, he damned the court and ripped your warrant. Now you have it. He did that, Mr. Hale? Aye, he did. It were a temper, sir. I knew not what I did. Mr. Proctor. Aye, sir. Have you ever seen the devil? No, sir. You are, in all respects, a gospel Christian? I am, sir. 
Such a Christian that will not come to church but once in a month? Not come to church? I, I have no love for Mr. Paris. It is no secret. But God, I surely love. He plow on Sunday, sir. Plow on Sunday? I think it be evidence, John. I am an official of the court. I cannot keep it. I, I have once or twice plowed on Sunday. I have three children, sir. And until last year, my land give little. You'll find other Christians that do plow on Sunday if the truth be known. Your Honor, I cannot think you may judge the man on such evidence. I judge nothing. I tell you straight, mister, I have seen marvels in this court. I have seen people choked before my eyes by spirits. I have seen them stuck by pins and slashed by daggers. I have until this moment not the slightest reason to suspect that the children may be deceiving me. Do you understand my meaning? Excellency, does it not strike upon you that so many of these women have lived so long with such upright reputation and... Do you read the gospel, Mr. Proctor? I read the gospel. I think not, or you should surely know that Cain were an upright man and yet he did kill Abel. I, God tells us that. But who tells us Rebecca Nurse murdered seven babies by sending out her spirit on them? It is the children only, and this one will swear she lied to you. Danforth considers, then beckons Hawthorne to him. Hawthorne leans in, and he speaks in his ear. Hawthorne nods. 